Digital Foundry is sponsored by Backedface, the leader in crash and error reporting for game developers. Click on the link in the video description and sign up for your free trial today. The rumours? Well, the rumours actually turned out to be true. GeForce RTX 3060 Ti is a real thing, a real graphics card, and we've been testing it over the last week. Now, NVIDIA promises RTX 2080 super level performance in a smaller, cheaper and more efficient Ampere design and, spoilers, that's exactly what our testing shows they've delivered. In fact, if we're looking at this new mainstream-ish contender as an upgrade from a GTX 1070 or a 1080, it's actually really impressive. And in actual fact, it's significantly faster than a GTX 1080 Ti, which is still a pretty good GPU to this day. In fact, by my reckoning, it should outperform a Titan XP all for $399 or 365 of our once great British pounds. That's assuming stock levels persist for long enough for you to buy one, of course. In terms of the specifications and underlying architecture, RTX 3060 Ti uses the same GA104 GPU as the RTX 3070, but with fewer CUDA cores, 4864 versus 5888 on the higher end model. The card also operates at slightly lower clock speeds to fit into a 20 watt lower TDP. The memory subsystems are unchanged, however, with both cards getting the same 8 gigs of GDDR6 with 448 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. Now, it's good to see 8 gigs becoming the new standard. All of the next gen cards we've seen so far have had at least that amount, as well as improvements to compute performance. All of the usual features of Nvidia's Ampere architecture are present and correct meaning that we're getting next generation ray tracing and tensor cores, so we can expect more noticeable performance uplifts in ray tracing and AI accelerated workloads. Of course, we've covered Ampere in more detail in our earlier RTX reviews, so let's move on to the card's physical design. Now, as usual, we're testing the Founders Edition uh, version of the card here, which comes with the same excellent industrial design and, well, the same basic chassis as the RTX 3070. Same chip, same chassis, same cooler. And so in this case, we're getting two axial fans in a flow through configuration with the small pennant shaped motherboard design and the miniature 12 pin power socket, allowing the final third of the card to be wholly used for cooling. Even the IO is arranged to maximize airflow with a single row of display outputs. Those being three DisplayPort 1.4As and one HDMI 2.1 and they sit beneath a 16 by 5 grid of ventilation cutouts. As with other RTX 30 series cards, 3060 Ti is a PCI Express 4.0 device, but works in PCIe 3.0 motherboards with no real loss of performance. Now, one of the biggest questions we had in testing 3060 Ti beyond its gaming performance, which we'll get to soon, well, that's power efficiency. RTX 3070 was substantially more efficient than its more powerful siblings. So how does the 3060 Ti match up? To answer this question, we use Nvidia's Power Capture Analysis Tool, or PCAT. An interposer board that sits between PCIe slot and the graphics card, as well as between uh, the 8-pin power input used by 3060 Ti and the power supply. This way we can measure the number of watts drawn by the card itself, completely isolating it from the load of the rest of the system. And we can plot this power draw versus frame rate to give us an idea of overall power efficiency. I'll let the table do the talking here, but basically in Gears 5, 3060 Ti hits a new efficiency record, whereas uh, curiously in Death Stranding, it's just a touch lower in efficiency terms than the RTX 3070. Obviously the spectre of big Navi looms large here, and this too has its own efficiency advantages. I think overall, both AMD and Nvidia have done an excellent job here in improving performance per watt from their new architectures. So let's dip into game performance, and I really want to talk about 3060 Ti as a replacement for a legacy card. Um, so you see, the headlines, uh, the PR from Nvidia has been about better than 2080 super performance, which is $400, and yeah, I get that. But fundamentally, who's actually going to be buying this thing? I see this product as a replacement for something like a GTX 1070, which released in 2016 
for much the same price. I do feel it's important to place 3060 Ti within the Ampere stack though, and by and large, there is a frames per dollar improvement over RTX 3070. Now, results vary on a per game basis, sometimes dramatically, but think of the 3070 as a card that's typically around 10 to 15% faster, but costs 25% more. In terms of which to buy, well, the advice there is always the same. Get the most expensive one you can afford with the features that you want. My benchmarks will focus on 1440p resolution and we'll be looking at it primarily in terms of validating the 2080 Super performance claim, but also seeing how this new contender stacks up against GTX 1070. A broadly price equivalent card from 2016 and also 1080 Ti, the flagship from the same Pascal generation. For comparisons against many other cards at 1080p, 1440p and 2160p, 4K, yup, as always, we have all of those numbers in our Eurogamer review and the link should be in the video description below. Okay, so as you've been seeing from this Borderlands 3 benchmark, NVIDIA's 2080 Super performance claim is validated. We see it averaging across the whole sequence uh, with just an 8% lead, but you know, that's still pretty good. For the record, 3070, the more expensive card is 13 points ahead. Still, it's established mainstream cards we're interested in here, where there's an almost doubling of performance all told versus GTX 1070, while we're also looking at a 24% performance lead over 1080 Ti. All of these leads actually increase by a few points if we bench at 4K instead, but I feel that 1440p is the natural resolution for this card. So, 3060 Ti slots into place at the bottom of the new Ampere stack, but not by a massive degree. And meanwhile, it's delivering a big cost saving compared to Turing, with big performance wins, huge even, against Pascal. Happy days! Remedies Control Next, which loves Ampere and doesn't much love, well, anything other than modern GPU architectures from NVIDIA, if we're being completely honest. 1440p here is good for a sustained 60 frames per second, and that's before we factor in the image quality and performance enhancements for DLSS. Anyway, it's here where the old cards are well and truly schooled. There's a 2.3 times multiplier in performance against GTX 1070, and a useful 53% improvement in frame rate against 1080 Ti. As you've seen though, we're on level pegging on average against 2080 Super. All told, we measured a 1.1% lead, so basically margin of error. Now, control thrives on Ampere, and the more Ampere you give it, the happier it is, to the point where 3070 is actually 17% faster. Shadow of the Tomb Raider next, where once again there's a slim lead overall up against 2080 Super, just a couple of percentage points really, borderline margin of error, but still living up to the marketing. The 3060 Ti is actually a touch faster on the first two segments, while the final third sees 2080 Super and the new contender delivering point-for-point -point identical scores. But those wide spaces on the graphing give you some idea of the most likely upgrade path here. RTX 3060 Ti is basically twice as fast as GTX 1070, while 1080 Ti only hands in 72.5% overall of 3060 Ti's performance. So the games tested so far thrive on Ampere. They're the titles that ran best on 3080 and 3070, and so it is with Doom Eternal, tested on Ultra Nightmare settings. 8 gigs of VRAM isn't quite enough for top-end texture caching at 4K, but it's just fine for 1440p, and here, 3060 Ti offers up 88% of 3070's performance level and delivers a 2.3 times multiplier to frame rates versus 1070. So yeah, as expected, that's pretty immense to the point where GTX 1080 Ti can only deliver 68% of the 3060 Ti's throughput. This is all pretty impressive stuff, right? Part of the reason it's so impressive is that right now there is no AMD rival. 3060 Ti is 27% ahead of 5700 XT. But yeah, those four games I've just covered there, they're titles that love the Ampere architecture. But what happens when we widen the scope and see how the new card fares in other games? And we'll start with Death Stranding. And a bit of an issue in that benchmarking this title saw my machine routinely crash when using Pascal cards. 
Did manage to get some 1070 and 1080 Metfix though. No 1080 Ti unfortunately, so well, this lineup will have to do. Okay, so gen on gen, Death Stranding wasn't actually that great when looking at 3080 versus 2080, but the 3060 Ti does just fine. Still four to five percentage points ahead of 2080 Super, but again, the gains versus Pascal are big. 1070 only has an average 55% of the 3060 Ti's output, and that rises to 68% against GTX 1080. The advantage for 3060 Ti at 4K is actually even wider, and all of that is before we factor in DLSS, which is a game changer in terms of performance and isn't available on Pascal cards. Far Cry 5 next, and while 2080 Super and 3060 Ti trade blows, the overall average sees both cards delivering much the same performance across the length of the test sequence. Thus far, we've seen GTX 1080 Ti roundly vanquished, and 1070 basically monstered. And, well, yeah, here, 1070 can only hand in 56% of the 3060 Ti's output, though 1080 Ti gets rather close at 89%, the closest we've seen the old Pascal Champion get to matching the new Ampere offering. Interestingly, at 1440p, 3070 is only 9% faster, and I suspect that may well be down to some kind of CPU limitation. Far Cry 5 here is heavily dependent on single-core CPU power, and the limits can be found even with an overclocked 10900K. The gap actually closes still further in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, where 1080 Ti is only 10 points off the pace, actually dropping to just 7% off the pace at 4K. The venerable 1070 can only deliver 61% of the 3060 Ti's output, though. But interestingly, at 4K Ultra HD, 3060 Ti is basically twice as fast. A quick look at Dirt Rally 2.0 here, a game I'm including because, well, interestingly enough, it's the only example in our test suite where we saw 2080 Super outperform 3060 Ti. I mean, it's 2.6% faster overall across an extremely long benchmark, so hardly likely to be noticeable during the run of play, but an interesting if somewhat academic data point. You're still getting big, big gains over Pascal. 1070 only has 53% of 3060 Ti's performance level, and that rises to 86% for 1080 Ti. A very quick look at ray tracing next. No real point including 1070 or 1080 Ti in these metrics, as while DXR titles will run with ray tracing enabled, there's no hardware acceleration, so performance is going to be awful. So instead, we're swapping in more expensive cards that do have RT support. RTX 3070 and RX 6800 from AMD. Metro Exodus, if you haven't noticed, is our first port of call, where we find a 14% lead for the 3070, but the 3060 Ti is still pretty impressive, beating 2080 Super by almost 7%. And yeah, 3060 Ti also manages to sneak a 4% lead over RX 6800, a card that costs $180 more. This is a really interesting use of hardware accelerated RT, by the way, focusing entirely on global illumination and emissives. Battlefield 5 is an interesting one where one of the first DXR enabled games focuses exclusively on ray traced reflections. Frame rate average in this sequence is around 70 frames per second on 3060 Ti, but there's an almost 8% performance lead over 2080 Super. It's a curious state of affairs because we only clock the 3070 as running around 10% faster in this sequence. Meanwhile, it's another win against AMD, with the 6800 offering up 87% of 3060 Ti's performance level. And we're going to end for now with Remedies Control, which runs the gamut of ray trace features, all of them enabled here, from shadows to reflections and much, much more. 3060 Ti offers up almost 12% of extra performance over 2080 Super, while RX 6800 only delivers 84% of the new Ti's output. And yeah, 3070 here, you get an extra 12.5% of extra frame rate over 3060 Ti. Fascinating stuff overall, as here in the ray traced arena, 3060 Ti is more handily outperforming 2080 Super. And of course, we're not benching with DLSS Active here, which boosts image quality and improves frame rates and makes that Golf versus AMD even wider. So I think that basically tells you everything you need to know, really. 
RTX 3060 Ti is a really nicely priced product. It brings strong 1440p performance out of the box and with DLSS it should work really well at 4K too. I've mentioned it a couple of times but I've showcased 1440p benchmarks here but the differentials at 4K are actually a touch wider still. I've got no doubts at all that this card is going to be a big success because fundamentally the price point steers it more towards those on older generation mid-range cards. This may well be their first GPU with next-gen features and yeah up against Pascal it's an enormous improvement in performance for much the same money if MSRPs hold up of course. I've not included 5700 XT in the comparisons too much because it really is way off the pace but I would expect to see a medium Navi appearing in the not too distant future which if scaled down from big Navi should be very competitive in everything except ray tracing and machine learning functions but yeah let's not go down that rabbit hole just yet let's wait and see what the actual product looks like. In the here and now at least 3060 Ti is a class apart in its performance level and slots in nicely in the existing Ampere lineup. So that's everything I've got for you now. Please do like, subscribe and share if you enjoyed the content and ring the bell for instant notifications whenever Digital Foundry posts new YouTube videos, live streams or whatever. And for those that want to support the team more directly and get everything we do in pristine quality, well that's what our Patreon is for and I recommend checking it out, obviously. But that's all from me for now and as always I'd just like to say thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry. Don't lose players to game errors and crashes. Instability will happen throughout the game development cycle during playtesting, beta cycles or after you've released. Backtrace was developed to automate the capture and analysis of crashes, hangs and non-fatal errors across PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, PC, Mac, Stadia and more. Our unique data platform allows you to index anything, integrate with Jira, Slack, Discord and run analytic workloads to better prioritise and understand your game stability. Many of the industry's AAA studios depend on Backtrace. You should too. Click on the link in the video description and sign up for your free trial today.